Good evening. How are you guys doing? Good. Thanks for coming out. My name is Dennis Baker. I am the new Life Raft Program Director as of like three weeks. So this is my second event. So thank you. Um, Melissa says hi from New York and obviously all that's going on there. So we give her our love. Let's have our, um, our panelists come in down. Let's give them a hand as they come on down. We have a great evening tonight, and I'm so excited for all the information you guys are going to share. We're just going to start off with names and a little introduction so you can um, put the bios on the website to the faces that are up here. So would you like to start first? Sure. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Judy Levine. I'm the producer of a film called The Sessions, which is currently in theatres, uh, playing somewhere near you, I hope. Uh, and um, I've been here from Australia for 18 years, uh, and it's been a very slow road finding a way to a film that actually is now attracting a lot of attention. So it's very exciting to be where we are at this moment in our careers. My husband wrote and directed the film. We're a, a partnership um, in every way, form and shape. And, uh, and it's great to be here tonight and I hope I've got some useful information for you. And if not, I will leave early. <laughs> <laughs> How do I follow that? <laughs> I'm Sean McKittrick. Uh, I have a company called Darko Entertainment that produces and finances films. Uh, we made a film, Donnie Darko, several years ago. Um, and we're currently shooting a film called Bad Words, which is uh, Jason Bateman's directorial debut. And to you. Thank you. Hi, um, I'm Shay Carter, and uh, I'm a producer at Pearl Street Films. Um, I'm also the executive producer of Argo. And um, I've had the privilege, actually, of working with um, my partner, Ben Affleck, um, on this movie, The Town, and Gone Baby Gone. So, um, nice to see all of you. Hi, my name is David Clowans. Uh I spend a lot of time on the internet libraries finding true stories. Uh, I uncovered the story for, for Argo. I was ex another executive producer on Argo. I also produced uh, Nacho Libra, which is also based on a true story. And that's my story. <laughs> Nice. Excellent. Just a reminder for you guys, we'll be um, chatting a little bit. You guys have cards. Some people have already written questions, but if you get inspired by a question, um, pass them. You'll see some people around, and we will um, get to those momentarily. Um, I kind of want to start down the line first, and for as much as you guys want to share, how did you guys kind of get to where you are? Because we all have stories, and we all have you know twists and turns and expected things and unexpected things, and so I'm just curious of however you want to share it. How, how, how did you guys get to where you are now? Starting we'll start here, yeah. Um, I think uh, a lot of it is has been just uh, a roller coaster of different events that have led to this point in our lives. And we came to Los Angeles, you know, with the promise of fame and fortune and streets paved with gold uh, after we'd had a film here called Paperback Romance with uh, Anthony LaPaglia and Gia Carides, which did quite well. And uh, But then it we found it wasn't quite so easy for us to transition into LA and the way things were done over here. It was quite a steep learning curve. Um, my husband started working in television and I was raising children for some of that time and also working on documentaries. Uh, and we did that for a long time. And he would have writing spells where he would write, and, and he doesn't write very fast, although I've decided now I'm going to have to put a lot more pressure on him. <laughs> but uh, he would write for a while and do something, and we had another project that we were thinking about pursuing, but we didn't take it very far because it needed another draft. And then he went into a, a really dry patch where he wasn't inspired to write at all, and he started... He actually started dealing in vintage watches. And I was still working in commercials and various other things. Uh, and at a certain point, uh, we realised that neither of us were earning enough money and I fell into a job in something completely outside the film industry. And I worked for a company that auctioned vintage cars. And I was editing and publishing their catalogues for them, very high-end catalogues. But I was doing that while my husband was writing. And he stumbled across the story of the sessions around about the same time and one of us with you know we had three children and a mortgage and two dogs and a cat and so I had a regular income and I was doing that at the same time as I was doing this film uh, basically working during the day and then moonlighting at night trying to raise money and encouraging him to do another draft and uh, so it's been a very sporadic difficult climb and uh, and that's you know this was a very tough sell this film and so eventually we raised the money privately and 
now we're here. <laughs> That's the short version. Um, I came to school down here, I uh, went to college here, and um, started interning for a producer during school and kind of realized, you know, well, they're not all wildly brilliant. Maybe I could actually do this. Um, <laughs> and so to be, you know, to be a producer, I did the natural thing that you do when you graduate, and that's go get a job at a studio and live in a cubicle and serve coffee for a couple years, which I did. Um, and during that time, uh, my business partner and I were working on the script for Donnie Darko. Um, and Richard had written an amazing script, and it was, you know, we were quite young and didn't know much. And so it took a little while, but during that time we came up with an idea for a TV show and I just remember selling it to Fox and we made $10,000. And uh, I remember at that point in my life I could live off of that for a year without a problem. And so I left my job at New Line Cinema and two months later, show doesn't get picked up, nothing happens. And I, ironically enough, because of Drew Barrymore, she came on board Donnie Darko uh, overnight, the movie had, you know, three or four companies that wanted to finance it. And because she came on board, six months later, we were shooting the film. And then, you know, from there, we've slowly evolved into a company that actually finances primarily independent films. And here we are. I'll come to you next time. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you cast John Hawks, I'm in. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm actually... I, let's see, I was actually born and raised here in, uh, in Santa Monica. And um, the last business that I was supposed to go into that my parents, like, it was literally do not, do not, do not, do not, was the entertainment business. And, um, uh, but, and I tried to steer away from it for a little while, and I think you always come back to what drives you most, what you're most passionate about. And that was trying to be creative um, and also mix in some business, which is, I guess, why... I'm happy to have ended up as a producer, which is where I wanted to go. So um, I actually started out uh, as an assistant. Um, I was an assistant to Ben Affleck about 10 years ago um, and learned everything when he was acting. And he'd already written and, and was producing. But at the time, he, he was not directing yet. Um, but he definitely had aspirations for it, which I'm so happy about. And uh, I got to go with him to set, and I did everything from the coffee runs, to the dry cleaning, to you know learning the business and kind of helping him manage some of his business stuff, and being on set and seeing the aspects of, of all that goes on. And uh, that's kind of where it solidified it for me that I definitely wanted to go into producing. And um, I feel fortunate enough that I work with such a talented guy who I think is a tremendous director. Um, so I feel, I, just, I feel really lucky. Yeah, so I, since I was 10 years old, always wanted to be a film producer. And uh, <laughs> sort of bizarre. I don't know why a 10-year-old wants to be a film producer. I still don't quite understand what a film producer is. Uh, and uh, so I went to NYU Film School and uh, came out here in the, um, the 90s, uh, mid-90s, and couldn't find a job to save my soul. I um, could, didn't have enough money to get a car. I had a bicycle. I actually rode a bicycle for six years. Uh, which is crazy. Uh, and I actually would go to meetings, pitch meetings, riding my bicycle. Uh, and I would have a backpack with a uh, change of clothes. And I would go in and pitch different true stories. And um, some of the times they would go for it, other times not. And uh, so over the years, I would just gather up. I would spend a lot of time in libraries finding these true stories and just gather up all this great material. Uh, one of them that eventually became Argo, and um, through the years just kind of raised up the ladder, and um, yeah, that's my story. <laughs> nice. Thanks. Um, these questions are exactly where I was going, guys. You guys read my mind. Um, I'm curious, in that journey, can you speak of maybe one or two people that, that kind of took you under their wings or maybe said yes to you when other people said no, saw potential in you? Any of those things where you're like, oh, if it wasn't for them, I might have not been where I'm at today. You have any of those people in mind? Open it up to anybody. Sure. Uh, for me, it was Drew Barrymore and Nancy Javonen, who yeah. her producing partner, because the moment they came on board, and Drew was on a real high, was during the Charlie's Angels, and um, the moment they came on board, I remember we had come, we knew we needed four million to make the movie, um, and we were only getting offered two and a half, which is nothing to complain about. 
but uh, it was difficult for us to pull off the movie we wanted to pull off with that amount of money. And, but the moment that Nancy got her hands on the script and then gave it to Drew, it, we were on the set of Charlie's Angels. We didn't really know. It was literally a 24-hour period, and we were sitting in Drew's trailer, and you know, the, her role in the film was originally written for a much older woman, um, a kind of an, an older idealist teacher. And she, w she just loved the script so much, she wanted to be a part of it. Uh, she, she just suggested, well, well two things. Um, can I play this role and Richard rewrite it for, for a younger character because I feel the idealism is still, young or old is still the same. And two, can we come on board and produce this with you? And so we're sitting there, you know, we're 24 years old at the time. <laughs> yes and yes, <laughs> no problem. So definitely Nancy and Drew, for me, were the people who gave us our shot. I would say, um, for me, it was uh, Chris Moore. I don't know if you guys are familiar with him. He's another producer who kind of, I, w I don't know if it's now reality shows are so prevalent, but during Project Greenlight, he sort of moonlit, I guess, as an actor, as himself, you know, on Project Greenlight. Um, big personality. He's amazing. Um, I was working at Life Planet at the time uh, when that was happening, and that's sort of how I met Ben. Um, so Chris actually recommended me to Ben I was, at the time, uh, I had just interviewed for an assistant position with Michael Bay. And then, and Chris knew about this and got the call and he was like, don't take it. He was like, don't take that job, don't do it. I have a better, I have another job for you. You're gonna work with someone, he's an actor, he does other, other stuff. What about Ben? You know Ben, uh, try that. So I would say Chris, for sure, started everything for me and, uh, and then and Ben for taking me on, I guess, and keeping me, so. I should thank him for that. <laughs> I'm curious, how do you guys define the role of producer? Because you were talking about how, I'm still trying to figure that out. And it's a, it means so many things in so many situations and so many ties. And so how do, you, how do you guys define it for yourself? What does it mean, we'll just go down the line, what does producer mean to you? Um, I see myself as being a little bit like the glue that holds all of the various elements together, particularly when, it, when any one of those things is going off the rails and needs to be brought back into, into perspective. Uh, and also someone that, that anyone in any particular, at any particular department can go to, whether it's the finance side or it's the production side or it's the acting side, um, because I like to be involved pretty much at all of those levels if I can be. And, uh, and I like to sometimes stay sort of on the edge of those things so that I can be the kind of the voice of reason in the room. So uh, I see that as a general part of the producing role and the rest of it I think I've, I've felt the same way you have, which is, you know, do I want a particular producing hat which is just finance and an executive producer or do I... I personally prefer to be hands-on, but I've seen, you know, I've, I've, I've learnt from people in all of those different levels and, and uh, I'm not always 100% sure which one I want, depending on how much work I want to do. <laughs> but that's, uh, my, my sense is that it should be the, the glue that brings it all together. Yeah, I mean, I would read Christine Vachon's book on what a producer does. I mean, it, she, re she breaks it down better than anybody can, really. Um, but you're responsible for everything and you're the, you're, most of the time it's, you know, we see the prevalence of producing credits and you know, who does what is very undefined. Um, but ultimately, you're the person who's there from the inception of the idea, the script, or whatever, until you know, it's out in theaters, or it doesn't even make theaters, and you're the one who bears the responsibility of that. So you know, responsibility is probably the biggest word I come, come to. Um, I would say that, uh, it's, I, for me anyway, I think it's really, it's always dependent on the specific situation, you know, the people you're working with, um, who the director is, uh, you know, just the, the overall group. I, I definitely, I don't think necessarily it's funny, you know, people get really bogged down and, oh, it's a co-producer versus an executive producer versus a producer. And I think that there are no real lines to that. Um, it's, for me anyway, it's about, I'm, you know, you hear about actors, director. Um, I think a big part of being a great producer is supporting your director and their vision because they are the one that kind of, you know, everything start, stems from them. 
And I think it's really important to do that. And in that, every pocket appears, which is, you know, all the different departments. The actors certainly are huge. You know, it's a big, big piece of that. Um, and I think that, for me anyway, that's the most important thing is to, is to support the director and then be accessible and be open for anyone to come talk to you and, and sort of be there for. Yeah, I think um, a big part of being a producer is um, being a problem solver. It's just like, it's as if you play like one of those uh, car video games and there's just all this stuff that's flying at you and you have to be quick and figure out how to solve the problem. You kind of um, be clever about it, you know, think um, unorthodox, out of the box of how, how you're going to solve the problem. And um, that's what I've had to do with my career in every step is, is, is just be kind of thinking outside the box. For example, with, with Argo, I uh, spent many years trying to set that up, going the conventional way, and I just couldn't get any production company to feel the same way strongly as I did about this project. And I was just hitting my head against the wall, and I was trying to figure out how do I set this up? And then it came to me that I would try to set it up as an article. And so I found a journalist and gave him all my research and helped him develop the article so it felt like a three-act structure. And we basically planted the idea in an article. And the article got a bidding war and was eventually set up with uh, Clooney's company. And that was just a way of problem solving that situation and thinking outside the box. And I think that's what you need to do as a producer to solve these problems. I also, when I think of producer, I think of um, the word perseverance yeah. of the long haul. You yeah, know. definitely perseverance and persistence and patience. It takes a lot of patience. Do you, um, do you have any stories of, of perseverance where you're like, that you maybe didn't think it was going to happen or this, or it was one moment away from, like you talked about, uh, just not in your story, about just continually having to just slog through it, knowing that oh. it was worth it? I lived off a of Top Ramen for two years. <laughs> <laughs> That's not a joke. <laughs> how, do you, how do you keep going? How do you guys keep going when, when it's moments like that? How do you like, just not go, I'm going to find a different job, or I got a, I got a, you know what I mean? I got a family to feed. Yeah, I gotta, yeah, like, three kids and a mortgage yeah. will make you keep going. You know? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I was in that job for six years with the vintage car auctions, and I, mean, I was quite happy for the first three years. I almost thought I might never go back to filmmaking because I was enjoying it, but the last three years was really hard. And, and people have said, oh, it's such an inspiration. You know, what's the answer and what's the clue? And you sort of think, I don't know. I just got up every day and did it. Some of the time I think I was so busy, I didn't have time to think about, you know, whether or not it was all going to fall in a heap. I did, we got yay close to packing up and just moving back to Australia. I was done. Even though we already had some of the money, I was still like, well, this could take another five years to raise the rest of the money and I'm just, let's at least do it from somewhere else. Uh, I think you just hang in there. You just, I don't know, may, I don't know whether we're wired to do it that way and that's why we all decided producing was the thing we wanted to do. I also wanted to be a producer from a pretty young age, I, I, born organiser. I think you just, you sort of hang in there with blind faith and, uh, I, you know, but I'm, I, I worry a bit about encouraging people to do that because I don't think it, I mean, it, it's, not healthy. It, it's not healthy and it, and, and you don't know. I mean, you know, that, that blind faith might be 20 years. I mean, you know, it's... Uh, I mean, we've been here 18, and it's been up and down. So you just, I mean, but that's that was it. I, I think that, you know, saying perseverance, I think that is definitely, like, one of the biggest pieces of it. I think it's also passion. I mean, in this business, we're all, everyone here is, it's all about passion and creativity and doing something like that. So this isn't a business of like a corporate ladder where there's, okay, you do you do this so many years and you climb this ladder and you get to this rung, now you get th this This thing is coming to you. This It's not like that and I think we all know that. I think if we're all here because it's something inside of us, we have this passion. And so if you have it much and you have this heart and you want to do it, you stick around for the 18 years and you slog through and you eat the top ramen and, you know, you do everything you can. You go against what your parents want, you know, which is a big deal. And it doesn't sound that big of a deal, but it's a big deal, trust me. And, you know, and you try and you try and, you know, other people compare that, oh, I, I was this age and I was doing this at that age and you're still an assistant and you're, and you're, you're you know, in your late 20s. I don't care about that. It comes from inside, something from the heart. And so I would say, even to actors, you know, there is no, there's no rung, there's no ladder, there's no, there's no time. It's he here today, if you stick with it, I would just say stick with, 
you know, what your heart tells you and go for it. I think resilience is the other word that goes with perseverance because there are plenty of times when you just feel like, oh, I can't do this anymore or you've just had another rejection. You know, we all get very used to the feeling of rejection and then you don't really want to pick up and go back and do it again uh, or try, you know, you just say, no, I want to throw it all in. And so to have that ability to be able to say, no, that was yesterday, today's a new day, I can get up and go out and ask somebody else this time and face the possibility of more rejection, that's a, you've got to stand up to that as well. <laughs> yeah, um, and this actually goes great with the question. Um, some, someone was wondering out there, can you talk about maybe a specific story where there was a lot of no's before you got that yes, and kind of what was that process like for you guys? Like, um, how many times? When did the yes happen? Like, you talked about the 24-hour thing. I mean, pick a movie. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Can you, can you, can you, <laughs> yeah, is there one that you would like to share or talk about, just this little bit of specifics of how that no became a yes, and what, what that process was like? Well, I mean, every project of mine is no, basically. <laughs> and it's, I have to turn into a yes. Yeah. And so, like I said, it's just like thinking of unconventional ways of trying to think of how to turn your project so they can say yes. I remember when I was uh, shopping around Nacho Libre, uh, which became this movie, Jack Black, um, and I was going to all these different companies and they just, weren't feeling it, and they were saying that the Lucha Libra, the wrestling, Mexican wrestling, was not part of the U.S. culture. And I was trying to convince them that it was, that, uh, you know, that it had become popular, that it was coming to the U.S. And I had met with this company and told them that uh, there was downtown this thing called Lucha Vavum, which had become this kind of Lucha Lib hipster um, once a month kind of club thing for hipsters, and they'd have Lucha Lieb wrestlers there. And so I got tickets. And burlesque. And exactly. <laughs> and when I, we know why you Been went there. there. I went for Lucha Lieb, he went for burlesque. Um, but yeah, there is burlesque there. It's, he, he is right. Uh, it's quite a show. You should go there if you can. It's very fun. It is. But uh, so I, I basically had uh, was trying to convince this executive that... Um, that uh, he should go down there. And so I got him tickets uh, to go down there. And it's funny, because I, I had gotten to know the woman that organized the Lucha Vavum from doing research on this movie. And part of the show is they have um, audience participation. And so I had given her the picture of the executive <laughs> beforehand. And I said, hey, can you do me a favor? Can you pull this guy out of the audience and do some audience participation with this guy? And so, sure enough, they picked the guy, the executive, who went into the arena and uh, with the loot wrestlers, and it was hilarious. And of course, the next day, I get a call from the guy saying, "Okay, you got a green light. We're going to pick the movie up." <laughs> <laughs> See, that's that's thinking outside the box there. I'm not sure we could get a sex surrogate to go out for people, with, <laughs> but it's a nice idea. I'm available. <laughs> I'll work on that for the next one. The sequel. <laughs> nice. Oh my gosh, that's um, great. Um, backing up a little bit, how, um, how do you, scripts, how, how do you find them? Stories, a lot of research, but how, when does the story come across your desk like this is the one? This is the one I'm gonna persevere, I'm gonna put all that time into, I'm gonna get a writer, I'm gonna make all that happen. How, what's that, is there a process? Is it just, you just know when you know? It's good to marry one. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> sleep with one. <laughs> uh, in our case, almost all the things we've done have, have come out of some simple story, uh, something that has been found in a newspaper or in the case of the sessions, uh, Ben stumbled across it on the internet and he read it and was immediately grabbed by it and brought it to me in the house and said, I've just read this amazing story, you should read it. And uh, I read it, you know, it's just 10 pages long, Mark O'Brien's original essay. Uh, and I could see immediately what he loved about it, but I always like to play devil's advocate, and there were things about it. I, you know, it, it ended at a point which is um, where, where I don't know if anybody in the room has seen the film, but uh, there is a point where the character is is very disillusioned, and that's where the story originally ended. And I said, I, you know, I think this is going to have audiences slashing their wrists, and it's, you know, <laughs> um, I mean, I'm always one for a happy ending, uh, but altogether, I just felt that there was, you know, it, it would have some serious thought would need to go into that. And, uh, and then in the research process of, of looking for the rights, we discovered that, in fact, 
this person had found a, a fabulous relationship in his life and so that was no longer an issue. But, uh, but most of our stories are a simple find and in many cases, true stories. How did Dar how'd you find Darko or how did some other the stories come out? Well, I mean, Richard and I were already working together. We had done a short film in college and so he had written the script, so it was quite easy to find that one because he just yeah. handed it to me. Nice. But uh, primarily, how we find them is, I mean, is through the agencies. Yeah. Will send us the you know completed script, or you know, it's it's the article that we pick up, or it's the writer that we hire with the pitch, with the story idea. And for for me, it normally just comes down to, what, do I want to see this movie? Mm -hmm. I mean, because you can't. Anybody who sits up here and says, oh, you can predict this is going to be a success or, oh, this is going to make $200 million, whatever, it's like you just don't know because there's, there's too many hoops that we have to jump through and we can control the film the best we can, but then is it marketed right? Is it distributed right? Is it released on the right weekend? There's a million factors that go into a success of a film. So ultimately, for me, it just comes down to, do I want to, would I go see this movie? So in... in in the independent world, it's would I see this movie in a specialty theater? Would I see this movie at home on VOD? Um, or would I go pay to see this in a theater? And, and um, it just comes down to your taste and it doesn't have to be you know, a specific genre or anything because I feel like I see, I feel like the Pixar movies are kind of consistently like the best movies of the year, you know? Um, some of the kids' movies are the best movies of the year. You know, we're, the super independent that was made for nothing is the best movie of the year. So it's, it's literally, do I want to see this story? Uh, I, will, I will add that we're also reading a lot of material now. A lot of stuff is being sent to us. And I'm thinking, do I want to spend the next five or ten years of my life on this project? Yeah, and sure. can I convince my investors that this next script will have the appeal that the last one did? You know, or am I going to have to go back to square one and start all over again, convincing people to put money into it? How hard is this sell going to be? Which is part of, you know, do I want to see this movie, but also will other people? Because I think there's a lot of stories out there that I might not have recognised as having the potential that they've had. Dumb and Dumber, for one, I think I might I might have passed on that, and who would have known? You know, it's a huge was a huge success, but um, I, I think that sense of you know, is this something I can put my own passion into? Is is really a big question for me. Nice. Um, there's a question here. Um, I'm just going to read it directly. It says, "Is Sundance the best venue for a highly original indie film, or are there others that are more?" receptive to something edgy. Does that make sense? Is Sundance still the end-all, be-all, or is it getting more diverse of, for edgy material? Well, I mean, there's, there's Sundance, Sundance is for the independent film is kind of the pinnacle. Um, Toronto is also a, a fantastic festival, which, you know, they have different sections in every one of these festivals, whether it's the Midnight Madness at Toronto, which is more of kind of like the popcorn fun, a lot of genre films in it. Um, each festival is different. Sundance is still probably the premiere for the independent, uh, but Toronto has grown a lot. Cannes is there, Berlin is there, um, Venice. I mean, there's a ton of them. And, you know, you, you t yeah, Telluride. I mean, there's, there's a million festivals now. Yeah. Um, and then there's genre specific festivals too. You know, San Sebastian for horror. And um, it really comes down to the type of film that you have. I mean, because we literally do evaluate where we want to take, what festival we should take this movie to. And usually it's different. Shay, this is a question directly for you. Um, um, as a woman working in the industry, which I'm sure, Judy, you can um, attest to this as well. <laughs> um, any advice from your experiences for other women, all fields, um, producers, actors, any perspective uh, being honestly, a woman? Honestly, the first thing I would say, truly, is be nice to the other women as well, okay? Because I have, you know, we've all, it, you know, we're all together. There's men, there's women, there's every, you know, everyone's around. But um, women, for some reason, and I can say this because I'm a woman, <laughs> tend not to be as supportive of one another as men are of each other, or men may be or may not be of other women that are around. And I, you know, I, I'm going to, I could be wrong, I don't know the statistics, but I'm going to say that I think still, you know, the business is predominantly male it's predominantly male, and it's male, you know, from the top, except unless, you know, you're actress, actors, um, you know, hair, makeup, wardrobe still is more predominantly women. Um, so I would say be mindful of that. If you've had a tough time, you know, coming up with other women, remember that and be kind to the others and support them and, um, and vice versa. But I don't think also that, 
I do also believe in like the best kind of people for the job, for the role. Don't, you know, I, I wouldn't just say, oh, we should hire this person because we need another woman to like even it out. It should be the best person uh, for, for the job. I don't know if that answers the question at all, but. Absolutely. Do you want to add anything that Judy does? Well, no, I would just second that, absolutely. I think, it, I mean, I like to surround myself with as many women as possible, actually, on set. I think it's really, it, give, it gives it a really great atmosphere, and I find that it's a, a wonderful, I mean, I think women work very well together with each other if, if, uh, if you embrace that. If you set that as your, as how you expect everyone to behave, then it's a wonderful, wonderful working relationship. And, uh, and I've found that women tend to collaborate in a much more, this is a broad, sweeping generalisation, but in a in a in a more um, collaborative way, they they tend to um, collaborate uh, without competition in the same way as as men are likely to do, and I find that very healthy on a set. Do you, oh, you oh, no. you want to argue? Uh, no, I was argue? I was actually saying I think I was kind of saying the op not the opposite, but that. Um, yes. That it should be the best person for the job, and I think that women tend to be tougher on each other, where they should be nicer to each other and and help each other out. Even as actors, actresses, when you guys are there and you're on set, and you're waiting to go in for your scene, and you know, sometimes I see like a lot of you know actors will talk to everyone, actresses sometimes, and then there's something on her face, and she'll be like, oh, I'll just leave it on there, you know, would help her out. Like you know, it, she's a friend, she's your friend, she's doing the same thing you're trying to do. My thing I think is look at the bigger picture, just on a whole. We're all working on a film together. We, so we all have, we're all in the same boat. So let's all row together, let's all work together. Let's, everyone wants the best thing for it for the final outcome. So that's your, you know, your co-star, that's your whoever it is, male, female, or whatever. I feel that everyone should just look at the bigger picture. You know, and remember, we're all in it together. On that note, um on set can be a very stressful situation depending on circumstances, what needs to happen. As producers, how are you that glue? How do you communicate? How are you available? How do you demonstrate that kindness to make sure that everyone feels that, they're, that you have their back? Do you have any examples you can share about that? Well, it's just treating people with respect. I mean, it's, it, and being nice to people. I mean, we, and putting everything in perspective, we're lucky to be there. You know, no matter what film it is, we're lucky to be there and we should enjoy it. Um, and that's not always the case because it's, sometimes it's impossible to put that many people working on the same thing and not to have at least one asshole. <laughs> you know, it's true. It's true, it's unavoidable a lot of times. But when you do, when you do find it, it's so fun. Um, and it should be fun. And it's just treating everybody with equal respect at every level of crew, um, every different department down to you know the the PA that's working his butt off and just like got out of high school you know it's just treating people with respect and and that and showing that the producers typically there you know we have the cliche that a lot of us don't work that hard or aren't there all the time um, and it, for us it's just you know be there all the time you're there all the time you're you're there the earliest and you leave the latest and just because a lot of people don't understand what we do so to always be there, respectful, know everybody's name is a big thing, um, get to know everybody a little bit, and uh, respect, really. Yeah, absolutely. Um, question here for um, the whole panel. What are the secrets to getting pitch meetings? Um, how do you, what, can you kind of just break that down of like what, um, I don't know if tips is the right word, but how do you approach pitch meetings? I know every pitch meeting is different. So maybe some of your experiences with pitch meetings at all, or how do you talk to investors about this project? What, what connects with them? How do you get them, you know, because you talk a lot about going to family members. How do you, what's the thing that goes, okay, yes, we want to, we want to agree with that? Um, well, it was very tough to pitch this film, you know. I mean, sex and Catholicism and disability, it <laughs> does not go down well in the room. <laughs> So we didn't get a lot of pitch meetings with this particular film. Uh, and uh, so, uh, you know, I mean, in terms of, of pitching to investors, though, that was a whole other story because um, we were very fortunate with our very first investor was a very old friend who's done very well financially and he happened to be with um, Ben when he went to interview the real Cheryl Cohen Green, who was the sex surrogate. And so he was, uh, he, you know, he was kind of had, had um, sort of taken the hook, I suppose, even though that was not the intention. It was totally uh, a 
uh, serendipity that he was on that little trip to San Francisco. Um, but he was in, so we knew we, we could go to him. He said that he would come in for the first 20% at a point where we had no idea what the budget would be. We just knew it was going to be cheap. So I guess he thought his, you know, saying that was probably a safe bet, and he probably thought we might never get it up anyway, so that was that. But uh, we knew we could go back to him. Um, and the second person who came in was also willing to come in for a reasonable chunk of money. I think that the wise thing was that nobody who invested in our film had ever invested in a film before, and we totally took advantage of their naivety. <laughs> so, um, and we basically, uh, after those two, then suddenly it was going to be a much harder slog, and we started calling people... Um, and there was, a, I mean, at that stage, we didn't have any cast or anything. It was just the story and the script. Uh, most of them had never read a script, but they, we did send them the script. And so we started piecing it together in small amounts. And after a while, I started calling close family and friends and saying, you're in. No, no discussion, no pitch, no nothing. You know, we're making this thing that's a little bit more than, a, you know, an expensive home movie. And... Um, and I was asking them to put in amounts like $5,000 and pretty much everyone we know has done better financially than we have so they could afford to take a chance and I don't think they ever thought they'd see their money again. Um, they just were being really nice to us. I think they were tired of seeing us struggle a bit. Plus, they thought it was kind of an intriguing subject and maybe didn't have a hope in hell of getting sold, really, considering those elements. But uh, that's how we pieced it together. So... And it was even a difficult pitch after we'd made the film. When we had John Hawkes and Helen Hunt and William H. Macy and Fox Searchlight had bought it, they were still worried about how they were going to pitch it to the audiences. So, um, I, and I was still not 100% sure we've, we've totally hit the nail on the head because I've been to Q&As at screenings where people have actually said they weren't sure they were going to go and see the film. You know, that they came, you know, in spite of their their, their uh, reservations about it. You know, they thought maybe there was going to be too much sex or maybe it was going to be, you know, a real downer because it's got disability in it or something. So even though Fox has gone out with a very sort of pushing the comedic side of it, which is all there, I mean, that's, that, that's all part of the film, um, they worked very hard to put the trailer together to pitch it so that people would be encouraged to come along and think they were in for a night of great entertainment, which you are. <laughs> Any different stories of how financially maybe your projects came to be or happened or how do you get pitch meetings? Get pitch meetings? <laughs> I can't even answer. I'm not even going to pretend to answer this, this question because I am I wish I knew how I need to learn this part of the business more, but I, I we get pitch meetings because of, of Ben and, and Matt and, you know, and various things. So um, I'm actually... I'm, we're really fortunate for that, um, but clearly I have a lot to learn about this because I think it's amazing. Um, this is an um, actor's casting question. Um, do you guys find yourself obviously probably in the room when it comes to final casting? How, um, what are the discussions behind that? How do you determine the actor is the one? What are, what are our conversations around that? Obviously some of the bigger act actors like Helen Hunt, there's offers put out, but when you're finding those actors, how, how are those decisions made between producer and director and anybody, writer? How, what's the conversations around that? Oh, well, I'm, I'm never in the room. Oh, yeah. I, I'm wildly uncomfortable being in the room, so I can't imagine what it is for the talent as well. But uh, usually, in the situations we're in, usually the larger roles, you know, you have to cast a certain level of known, a known face or a known name. Um, when it comes to the supporting cast, it, to, to me it really comes down to the director's choice. Um, and so I lean heavily on the director and the casting director. And the typical process for me is we, I don't even really pay attention to it until it's down to you know, four or five people for each role. And then we'll watch in the readings, you know, watch them online. And um, other people like to be in the room. And I've worked with producers on the same film that they like to be in the room. I just personally find it very awkward for myself. Um, but uh, so we'll watch all the tapes and we'll give our suggestions to the director, but ultimately the director is going to make the decision uh, for those supporting cast. Um, so some, if we disagree, it's literally just a discussion between us and the director. Um, I, I don't usually sit in either, but I do look at everything afterwards and talk about it, uh, you know, with Ben and, and, and give my personal reactions, but in the end I do the same thing. I mean, I think the decision is ultimately, you know, the director's instinct. 
uh, and um, Helen actually came to. Uh, we didn't have an offer out. We Helen came to us, uh, and and some of the when once John Hawkes was on board, um, uh, then the doors sort of opened for the for the role of the woman playing opposite John, uh, and so there were a lot of women who came to us, but we did approach John through our fabulous casting director, who I think are the unsung heroes of this entire process of filmmaking. And uh, we had a fabulous casting director called Ronnie Yeskel, uh, who cast Pulp Fiction and uh, Reservoir Dogs and, and Igby Goes Down and a number of other great movies. And Ronnie was very passionate about the project. And she went out, uh, She, I mean, she's known John for many, many years and has been nurturing his career ever since he first arrived in LA. And she really felt he would be right for the part. And um, I mean, you certainly don't, audition people like Helen and John. They were just basically meetings with, with Ben, with the director, uh, you know, two hour meetings uh, to see whether they liked each other, whether, whether there was a meeting of the minds. Uh, and then of course we talked about it afterwards and, and what, his, what my husband's sense of things were, what Ben's sense of things were. And, and the two of them you know, both felt that they liked Ben and trusted Ben and that's how that all came about. Um, independent producing, how do you see that in the next five years, 10 years, how's it changing? How's it moving forward with internet and access to content and not just through you know, the, the theater system or through the um, complexes? Do you see that affecting your guys' work as producers or, or certain scripts or certain um, type of, of projects you take on or how you then promote them? Is, is that changing at all for you guys or are you thinking in different ways with that? Oh. I wish I was 30 years younger. <laughs> yeah, I mean, come join us. Everybody's doing it now, you know. Um, it's, it is changing a lot. And I think it's, for independent film, we had this large lull where nothing was getting made because there wasn't the, alter the ancillary markets to put it out in. You really needed, if you didn't get in a theater, it's a failure. Um, that's changing rapidly. So for the, the true independent films, it's... It, it, there's other outlets to you know, get your money out and more importantly, get people to see your film. Um, and that's rapidly changing and nobody can deny it, not even the studios can deny it and they're just trying to figure out how to control it. But it's almost an uncontrollable thing because every year you see these movies that are made for nothing um, just by you know, talented people who wanted to do something and, and you see these wild success stories and that's not gonna stop, that's just gonna keep going. And you're still going to have the blockbusters. Um, those won't go away. But the outlet, it's so easy to get online. I mean, if you've ever gone on Apple TV and spent, just spend an hour on Apple TV, and you will see, my god, I did not know this many movies get made in a year. Um, who knew Brooke Shields makes like 30 films a year? <laughs> um, but she does, and they're there, and people watch them. Um, but it's, it's changing rapidly, and it's, and it's also with technology growing as well, um, more people that just have talent and a vision can make films without, you know, without emptying their parents' bank account or destroying their mortgage. Or it, it's getting easier with technology to actually make a film and make it look good and good enough for people to see on a massive level. So it's, it's just going to keep growing. It's not going to stop. Um. So then, how do you, with so many stories, with so many people making stories, how, how, how does yours get on the radar of the people you wanted to get on? Or how do, you, how do you make sure that the story you want to tell gets to the people or gets, you know, gets to the people that need to see it? How do you get through the muck, if for lack of a better word, of so much more content being produced? How much harder do you guys feel like you need to work as producers to, to get that story out, that you've been persevering, that you've been working so hard, that you've been blood, sweat, and tears? How, how, do you feel like your job, your workload increases because of that, or do you feel it's the same? Can you talk about just the process of getting that story out once it's made? Um, I wonder whether if our film... I mean, we never set out to make a film uh, quite with this much... Um, Pro, high profile. We, we thought we were making a little movie and we thought we would have pretty much unknown cast because we didn't have any money. And uh, 
And I think that the thing that's made a big difference for us is having the cast that we have. I, you know, I, I owe an enormous debt to them, to Helen and to John and to William H. Macy and everybody else in the film who really did it for nothing, which was fantastic. I mean, and, and, and no one was really getting paid anything. So, you know, um, uh, which was great because we were all in it because we really loved it and, and everybody was there for that reason. No one was there for the money. But I think that having that cast gave it the profile that it has today that, and drew the attention that it drew at Sundance. And, um, and I'm not sure whether Fox Searchlight would have picked it up in the same way. They certainly probably wouldn't have paid what they paid for it with a different cast. So I feel that that's a, a, real, a really important thing in today's market is, is that there's still this real draw, especially in theatrical, to see things, you know, the, the audience wants to go to something where they recognise the cast. And that's even, you know, we have a cast that's a little, le you know, I mean, there's a whole generation who aren't even really sure anymore, you know, about Helen's incredible oeuvre of work. You know, they sort of vaguely recognise the name, but, you know, the 20-somethings don't really know her. Um, and a lot of people don't know John Hawkes uh, because he's such a chameleon anyway. You can't recognise him from one film to the next. Um, William H. Macy, of course, you know, people know, but a lot of people you ask, like your regular everyday theatre goers, you ask them, you know, you tell them William H. Macy, they're not necessarily 100%. They think they know, you know, and maybe they're watching him on Showtime, but they're not, you know, so... Um, but that's helped enormously. I think we have a great depth to that. And I'd love to see that change a bit, but it does, I think, make a big difference. I mean, I, I basically look out for true stories that I think the audience is going to uh, really dig. That's true stories that are different. Um, I think that audiences like true stories. I think the executives like true stories. Marketing department likes true stories, although sometimes can cause some problems. Uh, I, the Academy, I think, likes true stories, hopefully um, for the sessions in Argo. <laughs> Who knows? Um, and... Uh, yeah, so I think for what I do, I think there's always going to be an audience for those kind of, you know, um, sort of uh, obscure true stories. I was going to say, um, I've actually been fortunate enough to work on three movies with a director who um, we've had amazing ensemble casts. So we've had knowns and very a lot of very unknowns. Um, and specifically, even in, you know, from Gone Baby Gone to The Town, and then now Argo, um, I don't know how many people have seen it here, but, you know, Ben does an incredible job. There was over 120 uh, speaking parts in Argo, which is a lot. Um, and, you know, each one is kind of, you know, he sort of handpicks, but he does the mixture of, there are obviously some known names out there, but he's big on, again, the right person for, for the role. So... Not everyone, and we've been fortunate where, you know, has a name, you know, they might now or they might, you know, coming soon. We've worked with some great actors. Um, you know, Scoot McNary, who's, who's kind of, who was unknown and is now coming up, Carrie Bechet, and uh, Chris Denham, and then some newcomers like Farshad Farhat, um, who is uh, wonderful in the movie, and, and Sheila Van. So I think it takes, it's, it takes everything. It takes a mix um, to, to make it really work so that, I think audiences also, you know, can relate to this and that. Um, and I, at the end of the day, if you get a magical cast, it's it's everything is is great. It's so much better. Thanks. Um, being down the road a little bit, you guys are um, have experience. So the people that are now under you, that you're um, have a chance to give opportunities that you were given. What advice are you giving them in today's market of? What does it mean to now be a producer? What are some things that if you were to start now, you're like, okay, I would maybe do it a little differently or maybe you would do it the same um, now versus when you did start back in the day? I, I, I think it's still, I think you still have to have all those things we talked about at the beginning of the conversation. I mean, you, you have to have passion and resilience and fortitude and all of those things that, that um, you know, even if you can, you know, make it all work for very little money and get it out there to a bazillion people on YouTube, um, it, along you're still going to have to bring all the elements together and make it work, and entertain people, uh, and find stories that interest them uh, and that have some relevance, um, and and just you know, I, I think that part of producing is maybe never going to change. You know, you have to have an eye and a passion and a sense of what, you know, I mean, I, I guess I've always 
been against the idea of making a film for yourself, you know, and, and that's just, I think, a waste of everybody's effort. If you, can, if you, you know, the idea of a medium that, that is there for other people to go to means it should be saying something or telling, at least telling a story that's going to entertain them for an, an hour and a half or three hours if it's Lincoln or whatever. But, you know, I mean, um, that's, you know, I think that that's still intrinsically going to be the same in one way or another. Yeah, and I would tell people, and I've told a lot of friends who came out of college or, or some of the like children of parents that I know when they're coming out of college too and they want to produce. Um, you just don't become a producer overnight unless you strike gold and you find that perfect project. Um, most of us went through a lot of ups and downs to, to get where we are and still do. You know, we're still gonna have ups and downs and I think we all understand that, that it's not, yo, once you make it, you're there. No, it's a constant struggle. Um, so what I usually tell people is, absolutely, but, but work. You know, get a job in the industry or don't even get a job in the industry and just have something that you can support yourself on because I, I just, the struggles that I went through all through my 20s, I don't wish on anyone. Um, so <laughs> it's always be responsible, with, you know, don't give up and, and sometimes it means you're gonna have to work two jobs. You know, you're going to be the a producer when you can during the day and night, and you're going to, you know, make some money so you can pay your bills during the day and night. But be responsible with it. It just means you're going to have to work harder, which I think it's safe to say everybody up here has done. And I know, you know, tremendous success stories of friends who have absolutely made it because they worked their ass off or they were in a cubicle being tortured by their old school producer who, who's losing his grip on the world and <laughs> wants to terrorize you. Um, and that's the only way they can make it through the day. But, you know, persevere and work hard, and, and, but be responsible along the way. And that's the, you know, I, I think you probably have, you know, the, the story with children as well. I mean, it's just, you know, adds to it. But uh, <laughs> I usually tell people not to do it. <laughs> if yeah. they say, oh, how do I be a producer? I say, don't. You know, just do something else. <laughs> and I certainly told my children that. <laughs> but, uh, but that's you know, that's kind of where it's at. I, can, do you, I would say hard, all these things: hard work and also be flexible. Um, again, don't expect it to come overnight. And and it does take a lot of time and hard work because. If, you know, I always say that you, you can't do your job properly if you don't know what you're doing. So if you haven't been around and listened, you know, look, also look for the people that have done it before you, that have come before you, that you admire something that they did or you respect how they work as a producer or an actor, whatever it is, and go sit down with them and listen. Instead of, you know, this is what I want, this is how I want to be, I want to make this much money, I want to work on this movie. To go and be quiet and listen to what they have to say, and they'll, you'll probably, I, that's how I learned a lot about it too. I've gotten incredibly invaluable advice from producers that have done it for decades before me, and just sitting and listening, and what works and what doesn't, and at the end of the day, just staying humble, never thinking you've reached this place, and you're like, I've done it, I've done it, now I'm, now I'm a producer, or I'm a this, or I'm a that. There's, nothing, there's always something to learn. You know, there's challenges, and you have to be flexible, so that's what I tell tell the, you know, the younger generation. <laughs> In this subjective, um, crazy business, how do you guys keep sane? Is it family? Is it friends? How do you, do you go running? Do you exercise? What is it that keeps you like, okay, I can, I can the craziness, I can peel away and, and get back to some grounded something. Alcohol. <laughs> I'll second that. He's not kidding, by the way. <laughs> ah, please. We've we've known each other a long time, and uh, yeah. Yeah, sex, drugs, and rock and roll. It's still the same as it was 40 years ago. <laughs> I, I think it's important to um, have a schedule, even if you're not working, is to plan out your day. You know, just don't sit at home and watch TV. It's like go out there, and if you're an actor, whatever you're doing, just keep on plugging away. Get exercise. Eat right. Uh, you know. <laughs> Don't it's play. so true, though. It is. I mean, go out for a walk, you know? Just, like, things will pop in your head, ideas, you know? It's just keep healthy. It's really important, or else it'll drive you insane. It's also, I think, for everyone here, you know, what we do, what, we all, what everyone does, isn't, isn't who you are. 
So is to remember that, I think, that, you know, we act, you, we, we don't, we, we act here. Um, you know, I try and produce, I try to do my best job and support, but that's not who I am. It's just something that I love to do, and I'm really lucky to be able to do it, but just remembering that that kind of differential um, and separation, I think, helps keep me grounded anyway. Yeah, it took me a long time to learn the separation, and it's still a struggle, too, because you're constantly stressed about what's going on, you know, in success or, you know, when you're really down in the dumps um, with work. I mean, I go so far as I don't even have, I have an office at home in, in, in a working office uh, on this old studio lot, but I don't have anything film-related in my house. And I just don't, because I like that, to, that you need that separation from from work, and I think that goes for any industry, but you need that separation, and you know, you need the family and friends that are gonna support you on that, and I'm sure everybody has those struggles, actors, producers, writers, directors, where your parents are rolling, your, rolling their eyes and going, yeah, right, you know, you're not gonna be famous. Well, um, none of us up here ever expected to be famous, and I, I'm, we're still not I don't famous. Think we're, famous. <laughs> we're definitely not the producers, famous. Producers, you know, no. the producers. Oh, producers are not famous. I didn't mean it to come out like that. I'm terrified to be in front of people or cameras. So, um, but <laughs> thanks for that, Shay. I, I owe I'll you get a you drink back. for that. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'll get you back. But no, the, the separate. <laughs> I could tell a story right now. But you won't. No, but the separation is very important, and, and family and friends for me is really kind of the where the separation is. Um, but yeah, there has to, you have to draw the line between those two things or you're gonna drive yourself mad. I've sort of had the opposite experience actually, particularly with this film because um, I think our children thought we were just delusional and that we were never really gonna make another movie and that Ben was downstairs playing Scrabble online and I was off doing this other job. And, and then when the film actually got off the ground, it became a very cohesive experience for all of us and, um, and, and everyone was involved and we made the film out of our house basically so and we still are doing all of the, the residue of, of finishing stuff up uh, still at the house and um, our eldest daughter worked with us on the film all the way through and our son helped with some of the music and our little daughter, our youngest daughter's in the movie briefly but in the, and so it was a, a very bonding experience which we somehow ended up living really every minute of our lives for the last whatever two years but that's been actually a really positive thing rather than you know, there's that life there and this life here, but that in fact that's all intertwined. Um, it might be different on another project where maybe they're not as involved, uh, but I found it more, it was a more positive thing to, to have us all engaged in the process rather than, um, you know, that's there, this is here, and never the twain kind of mix. So for me that was actually a really positive side of it was that they felt engaged in what we were doing. That's great, that's great. Um, this is a question for everyone. In these um, smaller budgets that you guys are working in sometimes, how hard is it to stay within the budget for production or film? And what do you do if it goes over? Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> we went over. Yeah. Um, and I kept making phone calls. <laughs> I just, you know, I mean, I'd come home from my day job and I'd be making more calls to people saying, you know, we need more money. Which got a little easier because we already had that incredible cast. So then the people who came in later on were taking less of a risk with their money. It was still a risk, it was still a small indie film. We didn't quite know, we, didn't, we never knew if we were gonna get into Sundance, which at that point was our, was our target. But um, uh, I just had to keep raising more money. It was still very low budget, but, uh, but it was still more money and that was the only way I could deal with it. I mean, we were sort of, it felt like we were hemorrhaging money, but fortunately, you know, people kept saying yes. So um, we, were, we were lucky and um, that's, that's how we did it. Uh, Judy, where'd you get the money for your movie? It's all private. All private? It's entirely private. So did you make the calls yourself? Absolutely. Or? And who'd you call? Um, <laughs> most... <laughs> I'm not telling you. <laughs> Give me the names. Yeah, names. You numbers. want their names and phone Let's numbers? talk after. <laughs> <laughs> if you've got a project that they'd like, I'm, I'm in for it. Um, uh, yeah, no, they were mostly people we knew until... Uh, once we were in production and we needed more money, in fact, I have to give credit to Ben's agent, came in with a couple of people who, uh, who stepped up with money and uh, we started reaching out to some people we knew in the States as well as people we'd known in Australia. Um, it's just the Australian relationships were, were really long-standing, so it was a slightly easier phone call to make, but um, 
we just, you know, who else? We just kept going back to the list of phone, you know, old friends and who, <laughs> pulling out old phone books I hadn't even looked at for a while. Who haven't I thought of that might, you know, <laughs> still be able to give us money? And, that's great. Uh, that's so serious that's, hustling. There. That, it, was, <laughs> it was endless yeah. hustling, yeah, but that's how we did We had to keep doing it when we, when we got into Sundance because that's an expensive thing to do as well, yeah, which right. we didn't know and we needed more money, but... That's kind of so how we did it. So these investors also go to Sundance? In fact, uh, two of our investors came to Sundance because they wanted to be part of that. And uh, uh, so they did. They came along uh, for, the, for the ride, which was Was it great. hard to get them tickets? Oh, they got their own tickets. We couldn't afford their <laughs> tickets. It was enough to take Helen and John and Bill. It's always a pain. <laughs> it was like, give us more money and then pay for yourself if you want to come. <laughs> um, can you speak about that experience? What is, what is that like for you guys going to Sundance? Because this is your first time? Yeah? This what, was our first time, yes. What, what is it? Roller coasters, what is that like? What's the experience? Is it do you blink and it's over? Is it, it up all nights with meetings and trying to get the deals? What, what was There it like was a bidding you? war over your yeah. movie, correct? Yeah, we, we had an extraordinary experience in Sundance. More, it was nothing like we thought we were going to have because we'd been told that the days of bidding wars are over, uh, that uh, even like a couple of days before our screening, we had a meeting with our sales rep and our attorney and everyone was saying, you know, the atmosphere is fairly conservative, people aren't making quick decisions, it'll probably be two or three days before we do a deal. I mean, we really, I mean, part of that is the psychology and we know they're telling us because they don't want us to get, you know, sort of to have high expectations. But, uh, but I think they were being fairly honest at that stage. It was only two or three days into the festival. And, uh, and so when we had our screening, we didn't know what to expect, but we certainly weren't expecting what happened, which was that as soon as the film finished and we'd had these incredible standing ovations, we had two standing ovations, and then all of a sudden the phone went crazy with, we have to get DVDs from the condo because there are these, you know, various distributors who want to, you know, want to see it who did, couldn't make it to the screening, and, and then suddenly it was, oh, you've got to get in a car and get up to the CAA condo, and then, um, and so, you know, and then it was like, okay, well, there's all these people that want your movie, and it was like... Okay, I mean, really, uh, we, you know, we were un unprepared for it, but we had very good people taking care of us, and I think uh, the, the sort of the wise thing that we did was we felt like this was our one big shot and that we were going to throw whatever we could at this opportunity. So we had, um, we decided we would, you know, CAA had asked us if we wanted them to represent us and they represent both Helen and Bill Macy, so they had a vested interest in the project and we decided we would do that deal with them. Uh, we had a fantastic attorney, Craig Emanuel, who was also a very old friend of mine I've known since I was a teenager, who was there watching our back. Um, we had uh, hired a publicist who would, you know, to make sure that the right people were coming to the screening. Um, so when we went into the negotiations, we had two wonderful people from CAA and Craig and us there um, listening to this massive amount of information that was coming at us very fast. Uh, and we, we basically narrowed down the numbers of people, uh, pretty much, you know, all the lowball offers. We kind of said, no, uh, it's, it's not enough because uh, we needed at least as much as we'd made the film for and, and hopefully more than that. Uh, and uh, we narrowed it down to two or three and then eventually Fox Searchlight said they only wanted to negotiate if they had, um, if it was exclusive and, and that we weren't in the middle of negotiating with other people. They didn't want to play that game. And we decided that we were willing to do that. So we went into exclusive negotiations with Fox Searchlight. Our screening started at 12.15 and we did a deal at 1.30 in the morning and signed the piece of paper then. So it was very... Uh, <laughs> it was, um, Congratulations. Very Thank you. Uh, and in between all of that, we were waiting in the condo... They, the representatives went off to Fox Searchlight and then they would call on my BlackBerry, so we were kind of listening to all this legal information on this little speakerphone. Um, then they said, go to the party, but we'll call you on your BlackBerry, so it was kind of, you know, embedded <laughs> in my hand. Um, we heard that, you know, the last offer was kind of while we were huddled on a little staircase at the back of a room where everybody else was partying at the front of the building. It was kind of, it was pretty, it was very Hollywood kind of experience and, and very exciting. Wow. wow. Um, the question here is for everyone. How involved are you in script development? How involved are you in script development? I'm very involved, but... <laughs> Extremely? Extremely? Yeah. yeah. Can you, can you um, talk about that process a little bit? What does, that, what does that mean for a producer in script development? Obviously, it's different than a writer and stuff. So what does that mean? What does script development process mean for you guys? What are you well, looking I mean, for? Yeah. What are you concentrated on? Well, I mean, it, it depends on how far along the script is, really. But... Um, 
how I tend to do it is I don't typically, typically the studios will issue notes and it'll be pages and pages of notes and sometimes they're decipherable and sometimes they're not. Um, typically what I like to do is actually just get all my notes in hand get and actually sit with the writer and sometimes it's an all day thing and go literally line by line through the entire script. Um, people do it differently. Um, everyone does it a little bit differently, but it, how we tend to do it, and it's kind of like our policy, is to not do written notes. And if you do, you turn them in after you've had that long session with the writer where you're sitting and analyzing every scene and, and you're giving them all of your thoughts about how to improve it, what you liked, what you didn't like. And a lot of it is asking the writer questions. Why did you do this? Why, why is this character saying this line now? Um, or why is this scene here? Or why is this scene even in the script? Um, and, and it's always a process. I mean, sometimes you go through, you know, 30 drafts on a script with the same writer, and it's just a constant, and a lot of the filmmakers, I'm sure, um, ben is the same way. They're constantly tweaking. While you're shooting. While you're, yeah. you know, before, during, and, you know, editorially is a, a different, editing is a different form of writing in a way. Um, but it, every, every project is different. Um, and sometimes you're working with people that are harder to work with in development, and sometimes it's quite easy. And sometimes you just can't come to terms with what you're doing, and a new writer will come on, or you'll exit the project. So every single situation is different. Um, the question here is, who hires the casting director, and what do you think makes a successful casting director? I mean, I, I will say, you said it earlier, that the casting director is kind of the un, unsung hero of the process, and um, I, I agree. I, I think that, you know, obviously, the, again, the director has the most say and the casting director, and if you're lucky enough to have a great casting director, um, things really, really happen. We had Laura Kennedy. Uh, she's over at Warner Brothers, and she did Argo. She also did The Town with us, and she's amazing because... She cares as much about the film and every single part as Ben does and as the rest of us do. And she also will, you know, with someone that will kind of stand up and say, you know, you're talking about a couple different people for the role and everyone's thinking, oh, maybe it's this person. She's like, but wait a second, you know, it's, it, I think it's this person and you didn't really get a chance to look at them. And, and uh, sometimes you'll look at 10 different people and uh, you know that's a, that's a lot for for you know one line or something, and she she does not tire. She has that same passion and perseverance. Um, and I don't know that all casting directors have that, but she does. Uh, so I think if you you know for all the actors, like it's great, to, it's it's good to know directors, producers, writers, whomever. But casting directors, really great casting directors, I think are incredibly helpful in the process, especially if they have the ear of the director and they understand what they're looking for. Yeah, and the producers will typically hire the casting director and you know have that relationship before and a lot of directors have relationships with consistent relationships with casting directors. So it, it can, sometimes the studio can dictate a casting director on you. Um, but typically the producers will hire, but you tend to work with people that on a consistent basis. Um, and once you find someone that just does an amazing job, you know, you typically want to continue to work with that person because they've done that great job, so. How did you guys um, find the cast director you guys worked with? Um, in fact, we had a producing partner, Stephen Nemeth, who knew Ronnie, and he was the one who introduced her to us. So that's how we, we came across Ronnie, and she was a gift to the production, really. Excellent. Excellent. Um, the saying goes, you're not supposed to have favorites, but do you guys, is there a favorite project where you're like, something about this project, you're just gonna tell the story until, you know, obviously, it sounds like for you, the sessions obviously is it, but is there any other project where you're like, because of this one thing or these series of events, I'm gonna be talking about this project until, you know, I'm retired and, and telling my kids, like, this is, this is, you just, you love, love, love working on this project for whatever reason. I don't, I don't have, do you have a, do you have a favor? I, mean, I don't well, have a Donnie favor. Darko, because it was my first movie, but um, we made a couple films with Bobcat Goldthwait, that, and he's such a lovely guy. It's always fun to work with people that, you know, are great people. Um, I don't know, it's hard to say. Every, every, it would have to be Darko for me. I think it, for me, it's, it's, and I've only done three um, in this capacity, but each one is a favorite for a different reason. So Gone Baby Gone was a favorite because it was the first time, and 
I literally felt like my head was going to spin off like during, during that movie. It was amazing, but it was the first time for Ben as director, first time for me even supporting that and being a producer, and everything is new. And, uh, you know, and Casey, his brother, was in that, and we had some great... That was... That first experience, I think, you don't ever get that. So, yeah, but each one has something special to it, you know. Um, I don't... It is like... I don't have kids, but I guess it is like kids because I don't have a favorite. Do you have a favorite? I would say Argo. Oh, that's nice. <laughs> I mean, it took me 14 years to get that made. <laughs> that's your favorite. Couldn't ask for a better end result, I think. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? Because how long did it... 14 for Argo, for you, how long was it for the sessions? Um, we basically dated from January of 2007 when we met Susan, the real Susan Fernbach, yeah. one of the characters. So it was, or it was kind of late 2006. So it was basically five years from when we met her almost to the day to when we sold it in, in Sundance. So that was five years, although I haven't stopped working for a minute since we yeah. sold it. So now we're getting into the sixth year at some point. I don't know when we call it a done deal. But, and I like the know. word you use, I think dating. that's quite young. Dating. So how do you... Um, when... In dating, when do you know that, okay, this is a committed relationship versus a <laughs> fling versus, you know, we're married and we're not going to get out of it and it's, it, 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 you know what I mean, I'm, it's all in. And that kind of thing of, like, 14 years is a long time. Yeah, it's a long time. Like, I'm glad you stayed committed to that for yeah. 14 and, and, years. And, and the idea of hindsight's 2020. Yeah. But hindsight, that, that's, you know, how do you know that in that 14 years that it's going to be anything at all? It's about being producer, you know, it's just the persistence and I just when I saw that store I knew one day it would be a movie and I had almost set up at several different companies and you know some companies wanted to take out the Hollywood satire of the piece I don't know how many people have seen it but uh, Hollywood uh, uh, is a big it big issue of the movie and they wanted to take it out and I was like no and I took off and I mean there were just so many different obstacles and so many different like people wanted to take different things out of the true story and I just stuck with it you know and, and until um, it got optioned as an article that I was able to plant in a magazine with the reporter and um, got optioned with Clooney's company and eventually got into Ben's hands and who did a wonderful job. Uh, but it was just, I knew, this is a gut feeling when you find a story that it's going to be uh, a good film, no matter what. And it was the same thing, you know, Nacho Lieb didn't turn out the way I wanted it to. Um, I had a, it's a different story than it became a kid's movie, but I eventually... I'd set it up at one time with um, uh, Tony Banderas and Benicio Del Toro, and um, you know there comes a point where you just have to kind of throw in the towel. I mean, I just I'd just been going around so many different companies with that project, and eventually set up at Nickelodeon, and I just kind of <laughs> okay, just take it, you know, <laughs> and because uh, I was just so uh, I was just I was just uh, tired yeah. at that point. Was the planning of the article for um, the Argo process kind of your out of the box thing? Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about that for maybe people who don't know? Uh, about the process? Of or the process and that what you did with the planning of the article and all that? Uh, well, basically, you know, I had uh, Tony Menez, the character that, that Ben plays, I'd contacted and I told him that, you know, this was in 98, 99, I can't remember, that when I came across, I was like, you know, there's a movie here and I want to, I want to, <laughs> I want to make this movie. And at the time, I had no credits whatsoever to my name. And uh, he had a book coming out at the time called The Master of Disguise. And uh, he was represented by CAA, and he had gave me, gave me CAA's uh, information, and I knew that CAA was going to turn me down because I had no credits. Uh, and sure enough, they did. And he had given the option for a year or two Mark Burnett, this producer who did Survivor. And it didn't work out. I didn't know exactly what he was going to do with it. But after a year, I called Tony back, and I said, hey, what's going on with your story? And he said, nothing. And I said, listen, I want to do something with this. And so he gave me his blessing, and I got some writers, and we went around, uh, you know, did a dog and pony show around town, pitching at various places. And I, uh, I remember I, we call almost set up as a, a TV movie at TNT. Thank God that didn't happen. Uh, and uh, uh, so, so I would just keep on uh, going different production companies and it was kind of tepid, the reaction. I mean, it's a hard movie to pitch. You know, you have a, it's a period piece. You, 
you, you have a Holly, it's a Hollywood satire, you have uh, the politics of Iran, you have uh, the CIA, it's, it's like a thriller, it's a comedy, it's a drama, and so it's, a, it's impossible for me to pitch, I don't know what I was thinking about, but I was so into the story, I just kept on going, going, it was like the Energizer Bunny, just kept on going to company to company, and the doors were slamming my face, and so literally my head was knocking on my office wall, and I was like, how the hell do I set this up? And uh, I thought to myself, you know, I had gone after several articles myself, and there had been, I wasn't able to get them because there were always bigger producers who were getting them. So I thought to myself, well, how can I figure this out? And so I got the idea that, you know what, I'm going to create my own articles, and I will own the rights, and then they'll have to come to me for the rights to uh, the movie. And so I had met a... A um, mutual friend had introduced me to Josh Berriman, um, who's a great writer. And at that time, he was just an LA Weekly beat reporter. I mean, he was literally writing about like pink hot dogs, <laughs> uh, pinks. And uh, I, but I liked his writing. And I said, uh, "Hey, I have all these ideas, and I'm, you know, I, I think if we're able to plant these in magazines, that Hollywood will go for them." And so I told him about Argo, and I gave him all my research and phone numbers for all the house guests and Tony Mendez. And I helped him build the article so it felt like a movie. And uh, he was able to set up at Wired. And when it came out, there was actually a bidding war between Brad Pitt's company and George Clooney's company. It was basically 95% of what I was pitching around town, but it was nicely laid out in a magazine with storyboards. And um, we decided to go with Clooney's company, which is funny because we had actually, we had imagined Clooney being it at that time before we had done the article. And uh, he bit and, and um, they had gotten busy with various other projects. And, uh, so they went, at that time they were going to write it, but they got too busy, so we found this great writer, Chris Terry, who did a bang-up job. It was, it was basically the f best first draft I've ever read of any screenplay. It was incredible. And uh, when I saw that first draft, I knew that at some point that movie was going to get made. And um, anyway, I think it was a year later that uh, Warner Brothers sent the script to, uh, to Ben, and he fell in love with it, and then I think three months later we were like in pre-production or something. But... Um, yeah, that's that story. That's great. That's amazing. Um, we talked about, yeah, go ahead, absolutely. <laughs> we talked about um, the script um, editing end of it. Now the, the film's been made, and as a producer, we are in the film editing portion of it. How do you, is there notes? How close are you involved with that? Obviously, the director has a different relationship with the editor than you guys do, but how close, how far away are you guys? Obviously, it depends on project, but you know, how involved are you in once it gets into the editing process? I, I'm very involved. I mean, we were editing in a room at the back of our house, so um, I would go off to my day job and I come home and then look at whatever was being done that day and look at you know every various form and variation of things. And uh, between Ben and the editor and myself, I think you know the three of us had the most input. Uh, I mean, I still believe it's the director's vision. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I would argue with Ben about things, but uh, in the end we all agreed, you know, and, and we could see it coming together the way it needed to be. And, uh, you know, there are things that I, I'm proud of having said, leave it in when he wanted to take it out, and other things that he took out and was, was a wise choice. So, uh, But I, I tend to be very involved in that process if I can be. Yeah, I mean, each movie's... For, for us, it's usually, depending on the director, because the DGA has a mandated period for the director's cut of the film. So typically, you know, we'll shoot the movie, and then depending on the budget size of the film, however many weeks later, the director will show the cut of the film to us. And then after that happens, it's an everyday process. And most of the, we've been lucky enough that most of the time we're, we see eye to eye with the director, on, and it comes down to running time or, you know, certain scenes. But... Um, other times it's been a little uglier and you have to come in and kind of take over and you live in the editing room. Um, but uh, it's one of the most important parts of the entire process. So as a producer who's probably struggled for years to get this made, that's not a place that you can let go. I mean, that's a place you really have to get in and you're, you're constantly, I mean, how many times have we all seen the movies that we've been a part of? You see these films a hundred times over before you finally lock picture. So involvement is it's all encompassing. It's twenty four seven at that point. And I actually um, I go every single day um, from the get go, but I don't go into the actual editing room where Ben will be sitting with Billy. 
Goldenberg, our editor, who's amazing. I'm down the hall, and I choose to share uh, an office with the post-production supervisor. So, because it's kind of, I feel like it's good to, like, you know, we're all in the boat together, keep it rowing together. To She's obviously not on the set every day where we've been or in the prep, you know, process and all of that, but I've been there throughout. So while they're in there editing and she's picking up all of this and we're moving along, each piece is mesh together. You can't look at it separately. So we'll share an office and I'm there and you know, if Ben wants us to see something, you know, come, okay, take a look and whatever. Uh, but for the most part, um, until we're all sitting down and watching various cuts of the movie, I'm there trying to help liaise with her so that we're making sure all the pieces kind of get braided together because she'll, you know, oh, we got to look into this. Oh, here's the shortcut or here's what's happened there. So there's a lot of glue happening. So that's kind of what I do during that time. Um, this is a question for everyone. Obviously, you, you find stories. You maybe find stories yourself, but how do, um, how do, other than maybe agents, other ways writers get connected with you or maybe a script that's already written comes across your desk? How do, um, how does the process examples of that, stories of that, where you connect with a writer, a writer found you, and you just, you got the script, and you all, you're like, oh my gosh, this is something that we need to make happen. Recently, um, we just picked up a movie that we're going to make uh, called Mississippi Mud, and it actually came from my assistant, my, by the way, unpaid assistant on, on Donnie Darko, um, who was working at CAA and was leaving his job, and one of his friends who sat in the desk next to him had written a script and just gave it to him to read. Um, so, it, he, you know, he sent it to me, and, I, and he was actually surprised I actually read it that night which kind of surprises me too, but, um, <laughs> but you know, he, I remember how hard he worked for me and we had stayed in touch and stuff and he really liked it. So I'm like, I got to check this out. And we ended up picking it up um, and we'll make it at some point next year. But uh, it, if it's not through the agency or the managers or producers you know, or even writers you know, it's, it's, it's from somebody you know, um, you know, family member, anybody, friend, acquaintance, friend of a friend, it's, it's usually through that. It's, it's, well, technically, we're not even allowed to, to bring in unsolicited material. So there's a whole slew of legal issues that you have to deal with. Or, and believe me, we've had, you get people out there who sue you. Um, we've had multiple lawsuits from people claiming that Richard stole the idea from Donnie Darko from their mind. Um, <laughs> and, and it, but it does happen. You know, Same thing for his second film. Um, so we have to protect ourselves in that way, but all, it's always through somebody you know in one way or another, or, or a recommendation of someone that you know. This um, ties in well. What's um, next projects coming up? What are you working on? Where are you at pre-production? You're, like, you're on, currently on set right now. You're going back there tomorrow. Yeah. So. I'm wondering if they're hitting overtime tonight. Yeah, you're, you know what I mean? So, um, how many, uh, the broader question is, how many burners do you got going? Like, do you have something that you're on set with and then pre-production on another, like, where are you guys sometimes at in the process of next projects? I'm hoping my husband will do the work for a while, actually, and get a directing gig that, you know, I can be involved in or not involved in, depending on what the project is. We're certainly looking at a lot of material at the moment. Uh, and we have projects of our own. Uh, I have a documentary I want to go back and finish. We have a feature, which is the one I, I referred to way back earlier this evening, that needs another rewrite that we'd like to do. We're dis in discussion with another producer on that. Um, and uh, I'm just taking it one day at a time because we're still very busy with this film. Uh, always. Uh, we're in, we just completed one film. We're hoping to take it to Sundance. We have another film that is being edited. We're shooting a film right now, and there's always, you know, 10, 15 projects you're juggling in one way, shape, or form. It's, it's always going to come together tomorrow, you know, and you just never stop working on them because you want them to be made. Um, I, I don't feel it ever stops. It's the only time it really kind of slows down on all the other projects is when you're actually in production because there's just not enough time in the day. Um. Well, we, we're still a little bit busy, fortunately, and happily busy with Argo as well, but um, in the, you know, in this, this period of it. Uh, and then uh, we've got a few projects in development, um, have not decided yet what we're doing next, um, but in various stages of development, second draft for, you know, we're waiting on something and 
we've got the Whitey and uh, the Stand, and then there's a new project about the South Pole that very early stages. So for me, it's sort of, I guess everything's on simmer. Can I have the stand? <laughs> I want the stand. <laughs> Negotiation, right, going on. What's your next 14-year project, David? Uh, <laughs> hopefully never another 14. <laughs> that would make me um, very old. Uh, I'm busy working with reporters, planning more articles. <laughs> One that I'll be showing to you soon, wow. for Ben. Uh, but yeah, that's when I'm busy, you know, planning more articles, hopefully that they get set up as features. And I find it to be a good way, you know. Uh, to set up movies, so I'm gonna keep on doing that. Um, what is it about true stories that you're like, it, it draws both of you to, to play in that area? What is it you're like, instead of, of dabbling in fiction, you feel like true story is where you wanna Well, like I said, I think, I think audiences really dig it, you know? I think they can relate at some, some, some aspect to it. Um, and um, uh, I'm, I'm into them, that's important, since I'm gonna have to spend 14 years on them. <laughs> I think I should be into it. Um, so, yeah. I think it's the authenticity maybe about it, you know, that somehow this is, that there's some, you know, some connection about it's a real person up there and something they maybe connect to on a visceral level, even not even on a conscious level. But uh, it's certainly, uh, like, like David, I've, something I've, it's always appealed to me. That's why documentaries yeah. appeal to me as well. So, uh, although having said that, this other project that we've got is completely a fiction of Ben's imagination. And certainly not everything that I'm reading now in terms of, other people's work, because we don't always want to be the ones to generate the material, uh, is is fact based. I'm, I don't I don't close off to any other possibility, but somehow it's the true stories that really seem to resonate. Um, thinking back about um, the people, the lessons you learned, the first project and the second project, um, what is some tidbits of information you were like? If, I wish I'd known this earlier, or if I'd known this the first project, it would have gone a lot better. What are some pieces of advice you're like, yes, this is something I'm still holding on to so late in the game. You're like, I, this always applies every project that I do, this wisdom or this information that you've received maybe earlier in your career. There's a lot. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's been Couple. a huge learning yeah. curve for us in terms yeah. of this particular project. So. I think there are a lot of things that I th I, I've learned on this that I think I won't do next time or I will know better from next time. But um, because we hadn't made a feature in the US before, our other experiences were different. Um, so, but from this one, I think, uh, you know, I've learned that I want to make sure that certain people in the crew are absolutely at the top of their game. Um, I think, you know, who you're hiring is a very critical question and, and we had fantastic people pretty much across the board but every now and again you come across a weak link and you want to try and avoid that as best you can. Uh, that's probably the most important thing for me. Good catering. <laughs> it's, it's, yeah. it's amazing how a crew and cast will revolt on you if your catering is terrible. It's important to make the crew happy. <laughs> It's about nurturing, though. I mean, I just mentioned that in something I was writing where I, even though we all joke about it, I think particularly if it's on a low-budget thing, everybody wants to feel nurtured. And even when I think it's a very big-budget thing, everybody's working incredible hours, you know. They're all getting up in the dark to get to set. They're working 12-hour days. Sometimes it's 14 or 15 if you've got overtime. Um, you know, they may be working only five days a week, but actually it feels like eight. And, uh, and, and pretty much most of those people are doing something across the weekends in between, that, you know, to keep everything moving. And, and so, you know, you're tired and you want to be nurtured. And, uh, and, you know, so everyone on set wants to be nurtured. And I think that's what the catering thing is about. They don't want to get there and find that they've got, you know, cheese and ham sandwiches for lunch. Um, uh, it helps to keep everybody, you know, warm and fuzzy. I mean, we work in a kind of an unforgiving business in a way on, on all aspects and levels. And so I think another big thing is you know, we obviously take it very seriously because it is our business and, and every, you know, you, you squeeze out every tear, every blood, every piece of soul, whatever you can put into it, every single person does it. But to remember that the one thing I always remember, you know, on the tough days, there's always challenging days. There's always days that are, you know, are we going to make this? you know, someone called in sick, they can't do it, is that um, we're, we're lucky enough to do what we do, whether it's making, you know, television, documentaries, feature films, whatever it is, um, that we're not, you know, it's, it's not as serious in that moment. It, you know, if you 
take perspective, I guess, is what I'm trying to say, is that uh, you know that's something that I learned, and I always try to remember on a day when someone's freaking out or someone else, and that the domino effect starts to happen, and then ten people are freaking out. That you're like, okay, let's just let's stop this from from continuing because we're lucky enough to be here. We're making a movie. Everything's going to be fine. Someone will film. Someone will help out. Help your neighbor. Do your thing, and let's move on from that. And then you always realize, <laughs> like. The sun will come out tomorrow, or maybe not, but you know, you hope it does. But it's that, I think, is the biggest lesson. Because everything falls underneath that, and you can get anything else done within that if you keep your cool and, and everyone kind of sticks together. Um, is there any misconceptions you feel producers have about what you do or don't do, or what's expected of you, or what the, uh, maybe actors or other people don't understand about your job? Can you enlighten us about any of those? I don't think people understand just how hard we work <laughs> um, and how long the process is for all. I mean, 14 years is like who's who's going to top that? But I mean, it's true. It's um, we every movie that we do. It's not just that small little piece. It's years to get the film made. It's a, a process of making the film is usually around a year. And then the distribution is a whole other, I mean, it's four, five, six years of your life. And uh, I, I think a lot of people don't understand that. So, because there's so many, you know, good jokes about producers that I'm sure we all enjoy as well. <laughs> um, because every, every one of us has worked with the stereotype, um, and, you know, on, actors, writers, producers, directors, all of us. It's like, there's good and there's bad. Um, so I, I, the amount of work that we do and the, the amount of sleep we lose um, for several years working on those films, I think that's the biggest misconception. I would also say that I think maybe, you know, and this is maybe even key for actors to know too, is a lot, the big misconception, which uh, it's like a joke, is you know, you see producers sitting behind the monitors in their chairs, and like someone's bringing them food, or and it's like really like you you can't go over to craft, you know, whatever. Or they're constantly head down and whatnot. I think that um, you know, obviously, like any situation, you have to read a room, read what's happening. If 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 the person is sitting there like really deep in it and doing stuff, something's always going on. Probably not the best time to approach them. But I do think, and we all kind of said this earlier, is that you know we are there to to make sure that the rest of the set is, is, is working, that things are working and be kind of a liaison and a conduit. So I do believe that if it doesn't look like a crazy time and someone just sitting in their chair, you know, if an actor has a question about something or whatever it is, you know, or it's a, it's a, this definitely happens with, um, with uh, you know, different departments, come up and, and, and ask, you know, is this an okay time to ask you a quick question or whatever. Take your moment, do your thing. Maybe you learn something from there. Maybe you don't. Maybe you learn the person's the biggest jerk in the world, or it's the wrong time, or whatever. But do it. Do it. You know, there's an opportunity there, and then you know, move on and go back to whatever you were doing. Um, but I think that that's important. I'm certainly there for whomever who's on set to come up and talk to you and ask a question. If I can't answer it right then, I'll tell you that I, I'll catch up with you and I'll answer it later. I think there's also this misconception that all producers are wealthy. Uh, not true. Yeah. <laughs> not us. Wild misconception. Yeah. Wild misconception. <laughs> so then how do you, um, I think this is a bigger work-life balance, how do you, when you're raising money and it's about the film and it's about giving them, that, how do you, how do you, unless you have that other job, how do you, how do you survive? How do you make it work out? How do you, how do you, how do you keep going to, to pay the bills? You just have to live frugal. I mean, I came from a very poor family. My, mo my mother was a school teacher. My stepdad was a struggling jazz musician. They were uh, supporting six of us. And I just learned being with my mom just really how to survive and uh, how to cut corners. And, um, you know, I mean, I, I recall uh, we couldn't even order a pizza in, you know? So I remember her getting a job at a secondhand clothing store so we could get clothes. Uh, she became a a school teacher so that I could get a good education at a private school. And it's just thinking on your feet like that. And so I've taken that for what I do and been able to spend 14 years setting up Argo, <laughs> uh, making no money, basically. Uh, so Don't spend it all at once. Yes. <laughs> um, so did you feel like you 
were sacrificing having that other job so your husband could write and play Scrabble down on the computer and do all those things that you were talking about. Um, did you think of it that way, or did you just like, I, it's, it's just putting bread on the table and, and paying the bills and just keeping the dream alive? I think there were times when I wanted to kill him. <laughs> um, and, and I, you know, I mean, I don't know. I, I, there were times, I think, probably when I, when I might have slipped into that slightly sort of martyrish thing of, you know, look what I'm doing here. Uh, but that was mostly when I felt like he didn't, you know, he wasn't paying attention. Um, uh, and I was having probably a bad day because of something completely different. Uh, otherwise, you know, I mean, I think um, uh, we sort of, you know, we have a, a very strong meeting of the minds in terms of his creativity and what, you know, and what I'm doing in terms of supporting that. But... Uh, and I, I guess, you know, I, I didn't sort of turn around after 12 months and say, look, you know, you haven't done it, so it's over. I just had, I just kept doing it. I, I mean, maybe I was foolish, but somehow I guess we just kept doing it, you know, I think. Uh, um, uh, and I, I, I'm hoping never to have to do it again, though. I do not want to have to have two full-time jobs, which is really three full-time jobs if you're parenting as well. So, um, you know, I, I don't wish that on people, but I think a lot of people do it. I know a lot of people in the entertainment business in every area who have had to take on other jobs to manage to do what it is that they love to do. And actually our son asked, I think it's the only time in his entire life, he's 21, he's ever asked Ben any advice and he sort of said, you know, what do you think I should do? And Ben said, well, learn to flip property and then you can do whatever you want. <laughs> <laughs> he, of course, has ignored that advice and he's studying to be a classical composer, which he's never going to make a living at. But... Um, <laughs> um, but uh, but I think that, you know, we all have to be able to sort of, you know, somehow look at other ways of resources and just and be resourceful like that in order to make our dreams come true in one way or another, you know, or else quit and do it, you know, get a real job, I don't know. How has the two years of Top Ramen or the other sacrifices you've all made make you appreciate where you are now and go, okay, maybe this sacrifice was worth it or maybe, I, or maybe it's made me have a different perspective about things. Can you maybe talk about that insight a little bit? I mean, it absolutely gives you all the perspective because you, <laughs> you feel better after you've gone through it, you know, once you've had a little bit of success. But so the perspective is, is different. You, the difference for me from, you know, God, 15 years ago, um, you let a lot of the anger go. You know, it's, it's, you don't stop working as hard, but you're able to learn that you can separate the two things and still enjoy your life if you're not succeeding at that right moment or that project isn't going right or you didn't get that part um, or you got another pass. Because, I mean, at this point, their perspective is so different when, when we're making a larger movie that my, that my company just it's too large for us to finance. I'm just so used to getting passes now, it doesn't even phase me. I mean, it's yeah. like... I shrug my shoulders. Like, okay, yeah. You're lost. Okay. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Next, please. And you just move on. Um, and and uh, you just get used to it over time. And, but every now and again, it will click. And sometimes it will take an egregious amount of time. Um, and sometimes it'll never happen. But when it does, you appreciate it more. And then you're able to appreciate everything more if you've struggled to get there. What do you think is most creative about your guys' jobs? Because you are obviously creatives, but you also, I, I see producers as right brain, left brain people. There's times where you get to be in the left brain world and sometimes you get to be in the right brain world. So what's, what's that creative part of you that you feel like, okay, this is, this is what it means to be a producer but yet creative at the same time? I think I'm a creative problem solver, which is pretty much the you know the the mix of those two things. And I, I mean, I, I I get a real kick out of being able to contribute to things like you know casting decisions or the editing, being in the editing room. But I think overall, when you were talking about problem solving, I mean, I think that's really, um, uh, you know, to to come at it, to think laterally, to be able to step outside whatever else is going on at that moment and see it from another perspective, to to somehow bring a a, a creative idea to solving even a practical problem is is what I think is is you know maybe my strength at least maybe our strength altogether. Yeah. I, I think that's that's what I would say too. Same yeah. thing. Um, anything that you guys are 
read consistently to find inspiration, whether it be for projects or just to um, motivate you. Another way to think of this is um, what gets you up in the morning? Like what, what, what motivates you to keep working so hard and what inspires you? Three kids, a mortgage, two cats, two dogs. You know. <laughs> I would say the challenge that no day is ever the same. You know, I mean, e even on the same movie, there's no days ever the same. The weather could be different, which is a different thing you have to, you know, um, you're working with, you're always meeting new people, always meeting new people, which I think also helps us, you know, I love that, like, what we do, because in our job, the learning curve never stops. You, I mean, you could let it stop, but it doesn't have to, because every single day, it's someone new, it's a different challenge, it's something, you have to figure it out, and it keeps the brain going. I love, I like that, I like change, I like, you know, but there is a constant underneath it all, of course. Um, that's what gets me up in the morning, and then the possibility to see something amazing come together and happen, and everyone be happy, you know, be excited about it. And, and even the, honestly, the, the tough days, or the things where things don't go right, um, and you know, you go home and everyone's upset about something. You learn something from that too. If you take a second just to to do that, so I, I guess for me, it's just uh, the hope of a new challenge and change, and and keep learning. Um, so I'm just, I didn't have a question, so I'm looking right now. Um, producers' relationship to actors, because obviously we're here at the Screen Actors Guild. What um, and I, and I kind of wanted to tie this in work ethic conversation because this is, I think, a field where you can, you kind of have to apply your own work ethic a lot of times. So how do, you, how do you define work ethic? How do you define work ethic for yourself? And how do you like to see work ethic in the people you work with? What does that mean for you? And in the ensemble building, building like you're talking about, the, 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 the best people for each job, what does work ethic mean for you in the field you work in? I'm a terrible example because I work all the time, and I, I you know, and I kind of, I, I almost, uh, you know, I have to stop myself from expecting that of everybody else, I, because the way I work is not necessarily the way everybody else works, and and people have different mechanisms for getting to where they need to get to, and and I, I have to sort of pull myself back sometimes and say, okay, they're they're getting to where I need them to be in their own way. I've certainly learned to do that in 30 years of marriage with my husband. Um, <laughs> he never gets to where I need him to be at the right time. But, um, <laughs> However, um, uh, I think that that's, you know, an important thing is, I mean, I've got very high expectations of work ethic and uh, I have to learn to, to see how other people do that differently and, and not judge them for the way they, you know, they, they, they have their process in place. Um, I mean, I, yeah, I, I don't have much patience for people who don't work hard, to be honest. Um, it's, I've been lucky enough, I can't even remember the last time that there was somebody I didn't see, you know, I, I honestly, I can't remember the last time that I noticed one person who wasn't doing their job um, and wasn't doing it, like, working really hard to do that. So, you know, with, with actors, you expect them to know the part and know their lines and, um, Every now and again, it doesn't happen, or someone's just off, and I, and I think you just have to go with that, and you have to be respectful of that, and you have to be compassionate towards that, and actually help them. You know, maybe just let's take a little break. You know, let's take a twenty-minute break, and the director, and they can step off. Um, but in, in acting, is obviously a completely different animal. I mean, you're you're completely exposed. Everybody's sitting there watching you. It's a um, I I couldn't do it. That's for sure. But uh, it's, it's, there's a difference between working hard and not showing up prepared, you know, and as long as everybody's working hard and doing their best, then there's not much you can do to complain. It's our jobs to, to be there to help you push it to where it needs to be. Um, I, I just, I couldn't even imagine if somebody just showed up completely unprepared. I really haven't been a part of that yet, mm -hmm. uh, luck, luckily, yeah. Really? <laughs> I'm serious. Wow, that's good. Yeah. I've, I've actually, I mean, I've seen a couple of situations where, um, unfortunately, sometimes you get someone that shows up and they're not of full mind at the time. Maybe they've been drinking too much or they've been doing something else. And that's another piece of, again, you know, regardless of what that is, our job is there to, okay, then how do you take this 
su support what's happening here, figure out how to make it work. Um, and whatever, you know, there's various different ways to do that too. Um, and I think, uh, but yeah, no, you're right. I don't think what- I do remember one. <laughs> you, see, I told you, I'm sure. Um, and it was on Donnie Darko. It was so long ago, that's what I remember. But it was a woman who we had to age. Um, and she was an older woman, but we had to age her about 20 years. And, you know, the, the pull and, you know, the pull, you pull the face and you put the makeup on and then it forms the wrinkles. Well, we couldn't find her. Um, about three days out from the shoot, we couldn't find her. Nobody was responding. Agents weren't responding. Um, we finally got a hold of her the day before and she came to set for her makeup test. And why was she gone? Well, she was getting a facelift. Um, but you've never had anything like that happen. On <laughs> I forgot about that one. It was my favorite story, too. Um, yeah, she had a facelift, and we couldn't touch her face. And we, we had to age her 20, 30 years, and she got a facelift. Um, and then we had to immediately recast the role, and we'd go to the casting director, and you sit there, and everybody's coming in. And she showed up, and I'm still scared of her to this day. I will say that there were people that, there were, you know... <laughs> Um, there were two people, you know, that when I think back on this last film that, I mean, who I guess I would describe as lazy, I won't work with them again. I mean, that's, you know, as, as much as I, I will, you know, give space for people who have a different process, if they're actually lazy, then I won't work with them again. It's as simple as that. And, and you know, in, in some cases, if I can, I will actually get rid of them and say, you know, you're not part of this team, you're not, you're not pulling your weight, you're not whatever it is, and we, it, this is not a good match. We can, you know, it's time to move on. I think it's also attitude is a huge piece, because you know every room you go into, every place you go on a set, whatever, has a vibe. And you know that tone is set, to, hopefully, in a great way from the top down, the director and, and everyone else. And so you have to sort of, you want to come into that, I think, as an actor and understand what the day is like, what the scenes are like, who's on the set. Maybe this actor has a different process. He's very method and she, you know, is, can be herself, you know, in between takes and then she goes right into her role, which is super serious. Everyone has such a different process. So I think reading, you know, it's, it's the producer's job to make sure the big picture is being seen and everything's being handled. But I do think that is also an actor's responsibility when they're there on set or they're there to just hair and makeup test, whatever it is, to understand and just read the space you're in and the room and, and have a good attitude about it um, and not try to either, you know, sometimes have your moment in it because it kind of disrupts things or, you know, be tough on something else or create a scene, but, but be part of that, of that vibe that's already been set, I think is important. Um, so we had a, I don't know if it was a bad story, makeup story. Is there any stories you, you want to share that are like sur uh, surprising stories or really just kind of days on the set were just, am they were amazing for whatever reason they were, where you're just like, it couldn't have been a better day. It just couldn't have been a better day. It was just, for whatever reason, actors, director, good weather, I don't know. It was, it was just like, this was a day that was just perfect. <laughs> or yeah, maybe there's not. No, yeah, there's great days. There's, I mean, honest, obviously I'm a little optimistic. And this, <laughs> I'm the optimistic one, I guess. But um, I, on this movie, uh, we had a lot of challenging days. I mean, we had days in Istanbul where we had amassed 1,200 extras in the cold, in the wind, in the, you know, like chanting and screaming out loud, doing all these things. They were incredible. Like, you know, they came out and they did it and they, it, was, it was tough. It was tough to even get, you can imagine, like water, tea, food, whatever, you know. They were amazing. And then there are days that I could honestly just sit and watch Alan Arkin and John Goodman off camera or on camera, didn't matter, and just sit there and be like, what? Like, what's that? You know, they were incredible. They're amazing. Uh, we had a, we, the whole cast, actually, that we had that Ben put together with Laura and, and everyone on this movie was just magical and uh, and I think that you know it's nice also I think that um, if you look at the film if you've seen it there's not one everyone kind of works together so nothing juts out or stands out which I think is a real testament to the actors understanding again the vibe as well as obviously Ben as the director and you know and the editing and 
So, I, I, yeah, I, I had a, most of the days on this was really great. We had a fantastic time because one of the advantages of, of only having private money from people who don't really know much about the movie business is this, there's no grown-ups on set. There's nobody breathing down your neck saying, um, you know, I mean, other than, other than me saying, you know, time's running out or whatever. And, and, uh, and everybody was mostly having a really nice time all of the time. And we had one day, which was our biggest day, which was about a twelfth of your day. I think at the most we had 100 people and that was crew and cast. Um, uh, and that was lovely because it just was a, uh, you know, it was a whole day in the church and, and it was lovely to have everybody there that day and to have that many people come to be on a project for so little money was, was very... And it was just a lovely day somehow. You know, the sun was out and everyone was in a great mood. So, But we only had 23 days shooting, so, um, you know, it went pretty fast and it went, you know, very smoothly. So, you know, every day was a good day when nothing went wrong. Um, that's, you know, that was nice. It's when you get surprised. I mean, every day you're going to have your little victories and you get surprised. I mean, we're shooting a film right now and one of the lead characters is an eight-year-old kid mm -hmm. and, you know, you never just know how they're going to respond and it's like the first day that we had him, he's in the scene and he's just like, oh my God, is he really this good? I mean, he's eight years old, is he really this good? So that, you know, that's a good day. Or when you're doing a stunt and the stunt turns out right and nobody got hurt, mm -hmm. that's a good day. You know, it's, I don't know if there is a perfect day, but every day, if, you know, if you're working with great people, there's going to be that moment where you're like, yes, or that scene that you shot that was, you were hoping to be funny and it turns out to be funnier, that's the day, you know. We're about over. I think we need to give these wonderful people a wonderful day. Thanks, Thank everyone. you so much, guys. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you for having me. Oh, wonderful. Um, One last thing, I can't let you guys leave without reminding you about our aid for um, Sandy. Please give if you can. Please fill out those um, surveys. They help us financially. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Thank you so much. Have a good night.